so I thought uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about the argument for the surgical management of C2 fractures in the elderly. Um, so the discussion today really pertains not to uh, the youthful people of the audience, but to um, uh, the management of these types of fractures in older folks. Yeah, this is actually, there's a reason why, um, there's a reason why we're talking about this, and uh, Dr. Rajpal and I wanted to, or Shari, wanted to talk about uh, this is, um, this is a ubiquitous problem for us uh, as neurosurgeons, because um, people fall and break their neck all the time, and we're on call all the time. And it just so happens that the person most likely to fall and break their neck is the old person. And the fracture that we see in old people is a C2 fracture. And we can never figure out what to do about the management of C2 fractures in older folks. And it's, uh, it's a problem that we encounter a lot. Um, and, and it's always a matter of debate for us. And so it's something incredibly common. And this is a question that for us uh, is important and germane to our, our life as a neurosurgeon and the lives of our patients. Um, as you can see, they're very common. Uh, we're not talking about the high velocity accidents that you see in young middle age uh, um, people, but we're talking about the fall in the elderly. And we're seeing it more and more and more often as people get older. C2, uh, 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 let's go into the anatomy just real quick. So the dens is the little projection coming up off of the body of C2, as you can see in this picture. And um, let me see if I can get this to work. Oh, yeah. So here's the dens right there. Um, uh, the base of the dens has got really a terrible blood supply, and it does tend to be osteoporotic. These joints here, these are the C1, C2 joints, they're really flat and they don't provide any translational stability for this structure. It's really provided by the dens and the transverse ligament. Um, and then also keep in mind the vertebral artery uh, goes right through this area. Here's a little um, picture of the vertebral artery flowing right through this area. And you see a type 2 fracture uh, of the dens right at the base of the dens there. Uh, another picture of the bird. So uh, this is um, a, a picture of the trabecular anatomy of C2, and you can see that, um, that there's a lot of variability in, in what's going on inside the dens itself. Each of these is a little different. And, um, but one thing that you will notice, there are a lot of these, um, these cross sections that show an area of sort of um, paucity of bone in this area right here where the fractures do tend to occur, and this is the area where it's very vulnerable to breaking. Here's some other cross-sectional images of the dens, and you can see between people there's a different, uh, you know, widely varying amount of bone uh, here. Um, we'll put up just a quick, I know you all don't really care about all the named ligaments of the cranio-vertebral junction, but this one's the big one. This arrow really is, is supposed to be pointing right here. This is the transverse ligament that joins the dens to the C, to C1. Um, this deep, this uh, oblique uh, diagonal ligament is, is the alar ligament here. Um, and really the critical structure providing stability here is the, is the transverse ligament. There's a classification type 1, type 2, type 3. Type 1 is sort of rare. Um, it's uh, usually a fracture through the tip of the dens. The very tip breaks off or uh, the side breaks off the top, but the dens itself is still structurally intact. Type 2 is the one that we're really talking about today. Uh, that's a fracture right through the base of the dens. And then type 3 goes through the vertebral body. Um, these are uh, three types of C2 fractures. And this uh, is certainly not an exhaustive list of the types of C2 fractures. <laughs> so it's time to wake up. The, um, this is another, uh, there's some subtypes, and I don't want to get bogged down in this, but you can have a straight horizontal fracture, you can have an oblique fracture posteriorly, an oblique fracture anteriorly. Actually, this is considered anterior, and then this one's considered posterior. But um, surgeons care about that. Um, it's not critical for today's talk. 
Um, it's a little confusing because this is a subclass uh, A here. Um, has nothing to do on this slide with a type 2A fracture. A type 2A fracture is just a type 2 fracture with a lot of comminuted pieces of bone right at the fracture side. Again, there's type 1 that we talked about, type 2, type 2A, and then type 3. And we're going to focus, we're going to focus on the type 2 fractures. We'll go to this slide here. Which one is unstable? A type 1, type 2, type 3. In that last slide, I told you that type 2 is unstable. <laughs> Generally speaking. Wow, that's a really good job. <laughs> they can all be unstable, but usually it's a type 2 that's, uh, that's unstable. Um, treatment strategies. Um, surgery versus conservative management. Um, we're going to, to try and determine what to do, we're going to look at the fracture type, the amount of displacement, how far has it moved, uh, the extent of angulation, and the interval between the fracture uh, uh, occurrence and uh, the treatment and in the patient's age. Uh, the type 2 dense fracture, and particularly the type 2A fracture, has a very high tendency not to heal. When we say non-union, we're just saying non-healing. Um, external uh, immobilization um, can be always considered when patients are not fit for general anesthesia or if they're so severely injured that um, the, the nurses aren't going to let us take the patient to the uh, OR and um, then sometimes we'll consider this external immobilization and the nurses like to jump on the patient because they're trying to whisk them off to the OR. Um, so, um, here's a study, um, a number of studies, and I'll just try to summarize these. Um, this, this first one, uh, out of Journal of Neurosurgery Spine in 2009, um, basically um, says that, that you, you shouldn't operate if there's minimal displacement, but you should consider t uh, uh, operating when there is posterior displacement in particular. Um, because those uh, patients with uh, minimal displacement do fine without surgery, but those with uh, any type of posterior displacement um, it, uh, are, are not going to do well. And then uh, Puzo's uh, article in 78, going way, way back, those that are displaced over, uh, over 4 millimeters uh, or um, those who are over 40 have an 88% chance of non-union. And it's still uh, numbers like that. Uh, Hold up even today. Uh, this last uh, this last paper, um, uh, Green Green determined six millimeters displacement was uh, was the amount <coughs> required to, to really not heal. Uh, in recent or remote fractures, there's a much higher fusion rate uh, when you do um, surgery. Affelbaum determined that basically there's an 88 percent fusion rate if you operate early. So let's say that you decide that you don't want to operate and you're going to just try a collar or a halo. There's only a 25% fusion rate if you wait. Um, that doesn't mean you have to rush them off to the OR that night, but if you wait several months and give them a chance to heal on a collar, um, what he found uh, was that uh, the fusion rate drops off dramatically when you um, uh, then have to work on it. There's, about a, there's a high complication rate, uh, and this is something that invariably uh, Shard will uh, talk about. There's a 10% uh, implant complication rate with surgery, and there's a 1% perioperative mortality and a 6% mortality within 30 days. So it's definitely something to think about. So can you work on older folks? I mean, is it okay? I mean, are they going to do terribly when you fix their fracture? Well, there's really no difference between older folks, those uh, that over 70 or under 70 in complications. This wasn't statistically significant, so there, uh, it, there's no difference in that number. Um, Post-operative stability, um, you can achieve stability in older folks, um, and 86% um, of them over age 70 can return to their pre-morbid 
uh, level of activity. So there's good evidence that uh, older folks do just fine with surgery. Um, let's say that um, we look at the bad side of uh, surgery. Let's see here. Look at that operative mortality or, um, of 11% at three months and 21% at a year. That's a pretty high rate of death. If you really want to see someone die, don't <laughs> operate. It doubles if you don't operate. Uh, and look at what this does, nearly doubles at one year. 36% of these older folks are going to be dead at one year if you choose not to operate. So um, this, this is what it boils down to right here. If you are okay with your loved one dying <laughs> at one year, then don't operate. Um, I want to show I want to show this one additional piece of information. It's sort of the same with a hip fracture. If you don't operate on a hip fracture, you're gonna you have a good chance of dying. But look, if you operate on a hip fracture, your rate of death is nine percent. So you drop it substantially. That's still a high rate of death. But um, so you can go from the front, you can go from the back, um, and uh, there's a lot of different nuances to try and decide how to do that. Um, you can go from the front uh, when the fracture, when the fracture uh, allows you to, and the patient's body habitus allows you to. If the, if the fracture line parallels the direction of your screw, then you wouldn't want to try to put a screw through a fracture line that parallels your screw. Um, and in those cases, you would go posteriorly. And your screw techniques, the one versus two tech, uh, one, one screw versus the double screw technique. Um, there's really no, there's really no difference in, in the efficaciousness of this one versus two technique. Um, um, posterior approaches, um, this is something that, um, that is a super effective way for getting this done. I probably have a little bit of a bias towards the posterior approach for these, but, um, there's some major disadvantages to the posterior approach, and that is uh, that you're going to lose the motion at the uh, at lando axial joint, which is about 50% of your your cervical rotation. It's about 10% of your flexion extension, which isn't isn't such a big deal, but this 50% number is huge. And then there is a measurable com complication rate in surgeons other than me. And uh, doing this, but uh, but it is pretty measurable, and there's things that can happen. We all get we all get complications, and so fusion rates. Let's let's say that we decide not to operate, and we're just going to put people on a cervical collar for this. Well, there's a, a type two fracture. There's like a 50% chance you'll fuse. If you use a halo, wow, it goes from 50 to 70. So that means you have like a 30% chance of failure. Um, or if you do posterior or anterior, you really have like a nearly 90% chance of achieving bony union. You say, well, why, why do we need to achieve bony union? Well, your spinal cord will get crushed if you don't. <laughs> You'll develop instability. And one thing that I didn't put on the slide that's really the most important is it hurts like hell. These patients that have instability here, they're in unbelievable pain many times. Not always, but many times they have unbelievable pain. And that's one of the challenges of non-operative treatment is that they have just remarkable amounts of pain. And um, when does non-union occur? We talked about some of these things. Um, older patients, uh, lots of displacement, are probably not going to heal. This is a study by uh, Phalanx, and, um, and he looked at, um, as a multi-center trial, and he looked at surgical versus non-surgical management, and he found really the things that are associated with failure are older age and initial non-surgical treatment. It was a 2.9 times higher risk of failure. So you had a 300% chance of increased risk of failure if you initially chose a non-surgical treatment. This leads us to this question. 
very difficult. <laughs> In his study, initial non-surgical treatment had better outcomes, no impact, a slightly higher risk, or a 300% chance of increased risk of failure. Pretty good. Great. Clinical outcomes. Um, this is a, just a quick study of 42 patients with eight and a half months follow up. 15% had a non union rate, and these were um, patients that had anterior screw fixation. There was a 5% perioperative mortality and a 10% three month mortality, which is sort of in the ballpark. So let's say that you chose, let's say that you chose. Um, to not do surgery. So if you don't do surgery, that leaves two options. Uh, you can put people in a halo, or you can put people in a collar. And I could survey my PAs here. How many people are going to heal in just a, a cervical collar with a type 2 fraction? They're just not. It doesn't work. So that leads us with halo immobilization. That's misspelled. It's <laughs> halo immobilization. This is where we put the crown around and attach it to a, 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 um, a vest. And uh, this is where we put the pins. This is sort of useful for, for all of us as neurosurgeons and our PAs. This is where you want to put the, the, the pins to the outside of um, just above the orbit. And the reason why is you have the supertrochlear and superorbital nerves here. There's no nerve out here, so sort of go from the mid, you know, or the mid uh, pupillary line and go lateral, just lateral to that. Unless you want the patient calling continuously with the remarkable pain they have shooting up over their head. <laughs> so, so halo sounds like a good option. You don't want to do surgery. Well, we weren't going to do surgery. The problem was 42% of older folks with halos die. You might be better off to leave them alone because this is just a remarkably huge number. The major complication rates in halo placements in the elderly were nearly twice as high in a halo device. It's an unbelievably horrible treatment option for someone who is in their elder years. They just don't tolerate it. Uh, they go crazy, they feel trapped, they have psychological breakdown, it's, and the nurses can attest to this. It's un and and, and uh, um, it's a, just an unbelievably terrible thing. So, uh, is the halo vest immobilization the elderly a death sentence? This was a study published in 2005. Unbelievable mortality in a halo. So I just, this was, this is the same guy, see, see. <laughs> And he's one, of the, he's one of the older folks that escaped. This was the very patient used in this slide. So, um, and he's going to, it's interesting because he's a neurosurgeon, he's going to talk after me. I felt sorry for him, so I let him talk after me so he could refute everything that I said. I just wanted to give him a chance. Um, these are types of orthosis, uh, Miami J collar, Aspen collar. Philly collar, I just sort of put that up, up so y'all can see the different types of collars that we use. And the other thing that really helps my presentation, and I think I'll end with this, is that, wow, I actually have some recommendation guidelines for the treatment of fractures in 2013. There's a level two consideration for the surgical stabilization and fusion of type two odontoid fractures in patients who are over 50 years of age. This Outside of the treatments that Dr. Beasley offers to patients, this is one of one higher levels of treatments in spine, uh, in spine surgery. Dr. Beasley gets to work up in the stratosphere of level one recommendations that we're never going to see for spine, but she gets to work up with level one. But this is about as good as we do with spine surgery, is to get a level two recommendation for treatment. And then there's a couple of level three recommendations uh, as well that you can that you can see here 
uh, certainly you can consider the initial management of non-displaced one, two, and three fractures with external immobilization. Um, but they put even in this level three recommendation that you have to recognize that there's a decreased rate of union with this type of with a type two fracture compared with type one and type two. So even in the guideline, they're sort of warning you that if you try this with a type two, you need to be prepared for a non-union. And then, um, and then surgical stabilization of type two and three fractures with displacements greater than five millimeters, or, and this is critical, so like when either one of us or the PA see one of these patients, if there's comminution at the fracture site, you really need to start thinking about an earlier surgery uh, rather than a late. And guess what, I'm done. On time, am I done? Yes.